Okay, welcome back. This is The End of the World with Michael and Stu. I'm Michael. And I'm Stu. And today we are turning to literature for the first time and discussing one of the great works of fiction, Mary Shelley's 1818 masterpiece, Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus. Michael, what's your life experience with uh, with Frankenstein and uh, other attendant created monsters? Very limited. Um, not <laughs> my type of thing. Um, the monster genre is. Really you're not, not like right. you're not you're not no. back in the lab. Uh, on it's the just not. It it never appealed to me, and I basically ignored it writ large. Um, and as I found out while reading this, um, at the age of forty, that. Uh, it's not really a monster movie or monster book, the like the ones that I was like thinking I was discarding. Yeah, I think the Hollywood adaptations of Frankenstein have given in it a patina of yeah, I mean, and the pop cultural idea of it. I think yeah, yeah, the Herman Munsters, the uh, the sort of lumbering mostly mute kind of growling beast that's sort of just like that's right that's right it's not really it's not really the most you hear about it is like you know uh it's the monster is not actually frankenstein (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) because it is such uh, a perfect name for a monster which is yeah yeah hilarious i forget where i forget where she got the name from i think it was like someone they met on one of their travels uh yeah uh I've taught this book so many times. Uh, I used to teach it when I was teaching like a remedial writing class at at Mm. CUNY. And we would do it because of the scene where the monster teaches itself how to read and write by spying on the the people living in the cottage. You're doing this in a remedial writing class. Like you could try this. Yeah. This would be one option. (laughs) Well, no, I mean like that's the funny (laughs) thing. Like pedagogically, a lot of remedial writing class work centers on stories about people teaching themselves to read and write. Mm -hmm. But there is like a kind of, you guys are monsters. And uh, so, right. Like (laughs) there's kind of like a negative subtext to that, that I uh, certainly not not sure the pedagogy (laughs) has fully addressed, Uh, but mostly, you know, this is a great book to teach because it's fun. Right. I mean, Oh yeah. This is the book that uh, my friend, David Hobbs uh, worked on this with uh, Maureen McLean at NYU and he told me that her reading was that like Frankenstein is like the ultimate text of romanticism writ large. It's like the book that pulls in all the themes from the sort of early 19th century German English artistic movement that we've called romanticism. It's interested in like uh, childhood versus adulthood, nature versus humanity, culture, the, the sort of nature versus nurture debate that's getting started, right? You have like science, you have industry, you have political subtext in Frankenstein, which I don't think we'll talk too much about because it's, uh, it feels almost like tacked on. <laughs> mm-hmm. The whole yeah. thing with the, um, the sort of Turkish uh, fiancés, corrupt father, and there's the sort of dealings in revolutionary France, uh, there's a lot of stuff in this book. It's 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 quite a rich text. And yeah, I think people come to Frankenstein often uh by the time they get to me at college, they're they've usually either come across like you were saying the sort of stereotypical Hollywood view of Frankenstein or they've had to read it in an earlier class. So I it's always fun. I often start the semester off with Frankenstein because it's just uh, the monster is so great. I just love how how emo the monster is. I always say that, and uh, I don't know if it's, it's incredibly emo character. I don't know if the students use the phrase emo anymore. It feels like finally out of his parents' basement. You know, yeah, like real yeah, lives. Yeah. Well, I mean, quite like quite literally, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but as far as like the end of the world, like there's a couple things about this book. It's not an explicitly apocalyptic story. I mean, Victor Frankenstein and his monster, th- th- there's a personal apocalypse there. I mean, by the end of the novel, 
they are literally at the North Pole and right. Victor is dying. His whole family has been murdered by the monster. And the monster is like, all right, well, now that Victor's dead, I got nothing. So he just like goes off into the into the ice, <laughs> <laughs> which is, a, is one type of apocalypse. But um, mostly I think the, the apocalyptic theme comes in uh, through metaphor. Right. Yep. That uh, in a lot of contemporary criticism, the monster is read as a sort of image for human ambition and technological progress, scientific advancement uh, gone out of control. Right. Like run amok. Like Victor. Like Sam, like Sam Altman is our Victor kind of, you know. I literally graded a paper earlier today where a student made that exact argument. So <laughs> it sounds like something. Like, a, sounds like something a precocious undergrad might say. Yeah, uh, I think I think exactly right that the risk is uh, with AI, which we'll talk about a little later in more detail. Like the idea that of of this technology sort of getting out of control and and uh, coming back to to murder us in some way is a, a theme that comes up quite often. I uh, Another example is 20 years ago, there's an essay I teach uh, on this by someone called Kim Hammond, where they talk about a genetically modified foods. Do you remember genetically modified foods? Around the yeah, turn yeah. of, the, around, you know, 2000, there was a lot of like, uh, protests about this it, it was like the anger. early it was like the early uh front in the like organic not organic war like you exactly. instead of going like uh where's the organic you would be like are these genetically well no modified? if you go to the yeah if you go to the grocery store things are still stamped like no gmo yeah know, but i just like, mean like it was part of the discourse in a way that it it isn't anymore yeah because i think we've mostly accepted that genetically well, modified foods are pretty much fine uh, yeah. they haven't caused anyone to grow an extra limb or anything, or they don't right. seem to cause cancer at any more alarming a rate than the other we'll see. carcinogenic <laughs> foods that we consume day to day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's we, impossible to scream. <laughs> um, we will see. There are uh, there were protests where people were wearing Frankenstein masks and sort of shaking them in the face of these. Yeah scientists and stuff uh more recently frankenstein has been read as a metaphor for climate change right where the monster is the sort of invention of uh technologies that you know output carbon into the atmosphere for instance so that humans like Victor Frankenstein, sort of create this new technology. Oh, it's so wonderful. You know, we're going to do this really good thing. But because of a lack of responsibility, this sort of indirect, disastrous consequence that humans ignore for hundreds of years, in this case, uh, accumulates to become a kind of monster that is now leading to, you know, tropical storms, wildfires, the sort of uh, climate-related disasters we hear about almost daily at, at this point. And uh, that's a reading that's become really popular. One thing that's interesting about that is that one of the early, one of the things that shaped the creation of Frankenstein um, was in fact a climate event albeit in this case, not a human caused climate event, but a volcanic eruption. So what do you know about, before we get into that, what do you know about Mary Shelley? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Absolutely uh, nothing. Except okay. that she was 18 when yeah. she wrote this, which is absolutely extraordinary. I feel like she's kind of makes her like that era's Katie Ledecky or, or Jennifer Capriati, you know? <laughs> Like, yeah what is I, that that's crazy young that's a, like there's symphony level shit going on there wait we say that again i mean the you... depth of this it's like it's like mozart level symphony as a child shit like this is like the level of depth the language that she's a child yeah you know Ex well, just exceptional 
Yeah, I think I think one thing that's interesting is talking about prodigies. Uh, what fields do you normally see prodigies in? Do you know? Music. Yeah, and sports. Sports, but also mathematic, I don't know. mathematics. Oh yeah, I guess we Right. do see them. Yeah, I was so going to math, say chess. chess is kind of uh, exactly chess is a sort of <laughs> form of mathematical thinking. yeah. Basically, um, prodigies. Of child prodigies tend to appear in fields that are very heavily based on pattern recognition because children can develop an amazing fluidity and facility for that in a way that you don't see as many like child prodigy painters or child prodigy writers right there are a few and i'm mary shelley's 18 when she writes this um she also had an incredibly good background for this her father was william godwin who was a very influential uh 1790s philosopher and her mother was mary wollstonecraft who was one of the pioneering feminist thinkers of the era of the french revolution so she her mother died sadly when she was born uh, in, in the aftermath of of giving birth to Mary Shelley, in fact. Uh, but nevertheless, she was still raised in her father's house, was made acquainted with, you know, was acquainted with her mother's writings from a very early age. She actually met Percy, her eventual uh, husband, hanging out, because Percy used to go and hang out at Mary Wollstonecraft's grave to, um, I guess, pick up ladies. I don't know. I, I, it was just like a kind of goth place to hang out. No, And... no stone unturned type deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so she had a great background, two very famous, successful writers as parents. And her husband, Percy Shelley, was, you know, is one of the so called canonical six British romantic poets of this era. And he also was quite successful at a very young age. Um, he starts publishing. poems that are still read today I think when he's 19 or 20 so she's got the background and she's an it's she's an interesting person because she runs off with Percy basically and Percy is already married to another lady and already has two kids with this first wife and he essentially abandons his first wife to just run off with with Mary Partly, I think, enchanted by her, her background, but also by her personally, that they would stay together for the rest of his life, though he would um, have re re repeated extramarital dalliances. Sure. Uh, they were radicals in the sense that they were believers in democracy, in the ideals of the French Revolution, but Percy was also a believer in what he described as free love. He didn't believe in the uh, constraints of marriage, shall we say. It's a it's a well thought out position though. It's not just it's not just selfish. There's a philosophical underpinning That's to that's it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's um. It was oh no no no. This is all from my reading of Plato. You must understand, right? Rousseau advocates for this. Therefore, I have no A staunch choice. advocate. Yeah. I have no choice but to cheat on you. Goodbye. Oh, don't right? don't don't bring Rousseau into this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you know Mary shared these ideals in theory. I think in practice. This was obviously awkward and, you know, for better or for worse, she ends up being widowed when Percy drowns at the age of 29, uh, just a few years after she writes Frankenstein. So, you know, uh, their lives are also surrounded by death, right? Yeah, it seems like there's just a lot of darkness around this this group. Yeah, I mean... They, I think by the time of the composition of Frankenstein, she's already given birth to one stillborn child. And they would have several other children who would either die very young or I think they only had, I think they had four children. I might be wrong on this, but only one of whom survived to adulthood. Also Percy, Percy Florence Shelley. 
uh, who is a monster, interestingly, not a, not a writer, not a, not a good guy, <laughs> just kind of like a British dandy. Uh, the thing about Percy is he's like, his dad was one of the richest men in England, uh, sort of minor noble, incredibly wealthy, and Percy and his dad did not get along. So like, they always have money, but they're always in these like kind of push and pull, like you need to send us more money. Like he's constantly like fighting with his father. And frequently when they do get money, they like immediately donate it to some revolutionary cause here or there. They're really like the 18 teens, 20s versions of like Patty Hearst or something, right? I mean, they're, sure. they're just they're just like <laughs> on the, I mean, they weren't, they weren't kidnapped per se, but they were uh, sort of, you know, trying to live out their ideals in a, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is, you know, I'm all for it. Um, people have interpreted Frankenstein as a kind of novel about Percy, that the Victor Frankenstein is Percy and that his, he's, he's undone by his kind of uh, devotion to his high-minded scientific ideals. Uh, but let's get back into the context in which Frankenstein is is created and introduce the other characters of this creation story. Um, so, yeah, so what was the weather? What was the the climate event that this was this was written in the background against which it was written? Yeah, so there was a huge volcanic eruption, and I'm getting this information from Gill and Darcy Wood's book uh, Tambora, which gives me a lot of the background. I'll quote from that in a minute. But basically, like. There was a huge volcano in Indonesia called Mount Tambora that in spring, I think, of 1815 exploded. And it's the largest uh, volcanic eruption in recorded human history. Okay. And it puts so much ash and pumice and gas up into the atmosphere that literally for the two years following the eruption weather patterns were severely altered such that um in the americas the year uh, 1816 i think uh was known as the year with no summer there were famines across northern europe in northern china there was a terrible famine as well uh mostly the northern hemisphere was affected by this but like people had no idea why this was happening this is something i'm always like i I mentioned this to my students and they're like, oh, so they like they they heard about the volcano and they were like, oh, that's why it's like, no, like at really? this time. Yeah. People had no idea why so it's just, they're just is it just rife with speculation? Yeah. People there were a lot of like God, God's wrath. Yeah. 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 And God's this is like things. right after the end. I guess of we the still world. have that. Oh, <laughs> when this stuff happens, when anything happens. Yeah. Well, this is right after the end of the Napoleonic Wars to uh, Waterloo's 1815. So there's already been just like 20 years of like nonstop death yeah. all across Europe. And now you have two years of famine after that. And so, yeah, there were, there were religious uprisings. There were mass starvation events. There were plagues. This is really like an apocalyptic time. Uh, the Shelleys, uh, although they're not yet married, are staying in Geneva with uh, right near um, Percy's good friend, uh, George Gordon, Lord Byron. Do you know anything about Byron? Do you have no associations? With, with I have like, not, no. So the phrase like Byronic doesn't mean anything no. to you? Okay, interesting. Uh, Lord Byron was the most famous writer in the world at this time maybe rivaled only by Goethe, the German you know, poet novelist. So essentially like Lord Byron was a noble, obviously a Lord, and he was a poet as well. He wrote these sort of epic retellings of, of his travels in the East and he kind of fictionalized his life. Uh, there's this massively successful series of poems called Child Harold's Pilgrimage that are you know are pretty good like lord byron's he's a bit of a like complicated figure um he didn't think he was going to be a lord he was like fifth in line for this baron baronetcy and then like everyone ahead of him died like very quickly and suddenly he was a lord when he was like 12 and <laughs> 
so he inherited all these estates and he, you know all these responsibilities he actually had to go to parliament and like he spoke in parliament and you know when, when he was quite young he went to cambridge uh but lord byron was like like the shelleys was kind of a rebel there's this famous anecdote where he gets to cambridge and there's a law there's a rule on the books that says you, you're not allowed to have a dog in your dorm your chambers must be dog free so uh to protest this instead lord byron brought a bear and he just had like a bear that lived in his <laughs> dorm it's like hey there's, there's no rules against bears you know like um so you know lord byron's complicated he's uh bisexual he's he had an affair with his half sister uh which he for which he was later canceled in one of the earliest cancellations by of all people harriet beecher stowe wow well, i mean ahead of his time with a cancellation yeah yeah i mean he was literally canceled he, he like left europe he left england mm -hmm. for, for good never went back he was like peace uh he had a very tempestuous marriage uh, and produced one daughter, uh, Ada Loveless Byron, who worked with Babbage and was one of the first people to ever theorize and write about computers. Kind of interesting side note. Wow. Yeah, he's a cool guy, a uh, complicated guy. Uh, he didn't really come into his own as a writer, in my opinion, until a little later when he started writing these brutal satires. Uh, he has this long epic poem called Don Juan, based on the sort of Don Juan legend, said pronounced Don Juan because of the way English meter works. Never mind. Uh, but he's he's quite um, he's quite a funny writer. He he really hates people and is like very good at just like savagely ripping them apart. Um, but he, like the, the Shelleys, was very into democracy. Despite being a, a noble, he went about Europe. He actually died in Greece trying to help the Greeks rebel against the Ottoman rule in the 1820s. This is after Shelley had already drowned. And uh, so, you know, he has a kind of heroic end, despite uh, some bumps along the way. And he's still very thought very highly of in Greece to this day. So he and Shelley were friends and they're all hanging out and it's raining all the time because of this, uh, this volcano that no one knows about. Now, now, do you know who the only person who was already dead by this point, but who had, who had up until this point, only one person had theorized that uh, like volcanoes might have something to do with the climate. No, I obviously have no idea. It's my old enemy, Ben Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what do you got against franklin so much uh <laughs> just over overrated hack mostly this comes from years of having to teach his autobiography where franklin's like his, his like legendary wit his like mm -hmm. little aphorisms about you know stitch in time saves nine you know basically right. all of his wisdom comes down to like make money <laughs> save the money you make it's like wow <laughs> thanks like get out of the way montagna like ben franklin is if he was around today would he be with one of these like big like don't keep buying avocado toasts to the to the millennials yeah, type prob guy? probably that would probably <laughs> be exactly what he'd be like uh you know I, I just hate franklin i also hate that he inspired a whole franklin impersonator industry like you ever notice that, that I feel like there are more Ben Franklin impersonators out there than just about any other uh, historical <laughs> figure. So about him really rubs me the wrong way. Uh, also slave owner, but you know, politically. There's that. What do you got against Franklin slave owner? Could lead with that. Roasted. <laughs> uh, also, you know, the whole fl flying a key on a kite thing. Uh, he never, he never did that. Right. That never happened. He just Ooh, like, he didn't do that. He never did it. No, <laughs> he like wrote a paper about how you could do it, but he never did it. How disappointing! Coward. In any case, uh, <laughs> the only person I hate more than Frank, the only person I hate more than Franklin is Da Vinci. Don't get me started Wait, on what. Vinci. Look, I'll say this for Da Vinci: at least he was a really good painter. You know, uh huh, uh huh. He was a great painter, probably the. You're best not as painter. interested in Franklin's 
artistic output no franklin's artistic <laughs> output is terrible what his <laughs> almanacs i'm not just like i'm just like cracking uh cracking <laughs> open the almanac after i get home from a long day at work like uh, oh ha, ha, like <laughs> whole season for growing uh mildew or whatever like anyway no da vinci uh, just the fact that people are like da vinci was this great inventor have you ever seen da vinci's inventions no the worst Da Vinci's inventions are like, what if you put like big balloons on your feet so you could like walk or walk across a river? And I'm just like, yo, anyone who's ever been a kid has like tried to stand on like an inflatable raft. Like it's not going to go well. Oh, Da Vinci. Oh, Da Vinci invented the helicopter. Yeah. Like, really? Like you, you try to use that thing. That thing's not going anywhere. Oh, Da Vinci invented a tank. You know what's missing from Da Vinci's tank? Uh, a door. Uh, <laughs> any way for it to steer yeah just da vinci's inventions are all garbage he's a terrible inventor really good painter though unlike franklin not even a good painter just a hack <laughs> sorry anyway one thing franklin did get right though and this is from the darcy wood book he says that uh Franklin's meteorological imaginations and conjectures amount to no more than a few pages of disconnected thoughts, like all of his work, mm -hmm. scribbled amid a high-stakes diplomatic drama. This is when he was in France, I think, uh, negotiating for American independence. Uh, the paper's unlikely fame as a scientific document rests on its being the first published speculation on the link between volcanism and extreme weather. Franklin hastily sent his paper on meteorology to Manchester, where the local philosophical society had awarded him an honorary membership. On December 22nd, 1784, the president of the society rose to speak on Franklin's behalf. No doubt dismayed at the paper's thinness. <laughs> Ironic, Franklin, thin paper, large man. He had no choice but to read the conjectures of the society's celebrated new member, to the crowded assembly there in freezing manchester public hall the theory that volcanic eruptions were capable of wreaking climate havoc was given its first public utterance and ridiculed they were like this is the stupidest thing this guy's really this guy's the great wow. american genius this guy's an idiot yeah <laughs> so real al, Gore, real, real al Gore vibes yeah yeah so fr franklin was right about this <laughs> for once you know broken clock um he <laughs> Sorry, I just hate Franklin so much. I just have such hatred for him. Um, he was he was right about this. And like it was climate that had caused this like gloom to descend over all of Europe. What this was the weather? What was the weather actually like as a result of this when they were in this villa? Basically, I think it didn't rise much above the 50s Fahrenheit. Like okay. just kind of rainy gray. I don't think it was literally like snowing in Geneva in like July, mm -hmm. but it was miserable and no one knew why. And the assumption was we must have done something to really anger God. And so they're hanging out and to keep themselves busy, they decide to have a, I remember this is the, they've been reading a lot of Gothic German, tawdry Gothic German tales Mm -hmm. uh, just for entertainment they decided well we could create horror stories of our own that will uh, that will entertain us and percy's uh story never really gets off the ground i think <laughs> percy's such a weird guy he like sees his reflection and gets scared and has to like run away <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's a maniac uh lord byron writes something that's kind of about a vampire and then that gets taken up by his doctor, who's also um, hanging out with him, this guy, Polidori, who turns this into a story called The Vampire. And The Vampire... His doctor. Yeah. Who's also a writer. Who heard, just like, heard Byron's idea and was like, I'll take that. Yeah. And Byron was Great. like, go ahead. Byron, sure, Byron, yeah, Byron was it. like, take it. I don't this care. piece of shit? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it's, all, it's all you, Polidori. Uh, Polidori, I think, is the uncle of the Rossettis, Dante Gabriel, Christina, William Michael, etc. Anyway, just an interesting footnote. Um, interesting to like no one but me. But anyway, um, <laughs> the the vampire becomes an important source, though, about 70, 80 years later for an Irish writer named Bram Stoker. Sure. Uh, and I like to point this out because, you know, the two iconic Hollywood monsters 
got to go with Dracula, number one. Oh, yeah. Uh, and yep. then number two is is Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of interesting. Just out of this, just out of this one house. Yeah, exactly. That they both it's kind really... of stem from this this one incident. Um, yeah, I mean, the Hollywood horror was born on this. This. It's like I remember remember when COVID was happening. There was the there was the meme of like you know was it like Lear uh, Shakespeare wrote Lear. Yeah, during, yeah. Imagine what's gonna like... what's gonna come of this. But this is actually kind of like that. You yeah, know? yeah. Like uh, I mean, it only took them a couple, a couple months, I guess. But yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, how look at all the leers we got after after COVID. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Still waiting. <laughs> Although it takes longer to publish things now, I think. It's got to get the whole marketing that. campaign behind the new King Lear that's no doubt ready to emerge. Yeah. Um. So, Mary had a dream that inspired this story, and it was a dream of the being, kind of like a reaching towards her. And she and Percy were both very interested in Galvani. Are you familiar with galvanism? Like the electrical? Yeah, yeah. Like when you theory? get gal like galvanized rubber, like for your yeah. tires and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, Galvani was the guy who had invented uh, running electricity through stuff, essentially. Sure. And he famously did demonstrations where uh, they would reanimate uh, frogs you know the, the frog is dead you, you electrocute what a sick fuck oh yeah well they did it to people too <laughs> well, so i'm like, sure it's only stone's throw next step right mm -hmm. uh you know you, you like shock a guy a dead, dead body and it's it's like did anyone slippery slope galvanism like, where does this end <laughs> uh, probably um <laughs> yeah I, I forget what happened to galvani probably probably nothing good um <laughs> Yeah, so they're already interested in this idea, right? That that of bringing of electricity being somehow the spark of life, and so yeah. I think the story really flows from that. Um, now, Victor in the story is inspired by like the death of his mother, right? His mother dies, and this leads him to be, you know, shattered. He says, ah, "There must be some way that I could overcome this seemingly ideal boundary between life and death." Right. It has to be possible. There has to be some way I can do it. Goes off to college at Ingolstadt and spends, you know, he, meet, he has some pushback from some of his professors. Right. The other thing is Victor's really into like alchemy. He's really into Paracelsus and Cornelius Agrippa, uh, Albertus Magnus, who are all like medieval sort of scientists who by the, the, the novel set in the 1790s, I think by that time, the you know the professors are like what like it would be like the equivalent of you going into you know university and being like yeah i want to study like galvani i want to use right. galvani's experiments like professor would be like well you know we've like like made a few advancements <laughs> since, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> since 1800 right like you'd be like and you and you're just been victor's like i like f you like no, you're wrong. Sure. He, he's like very stubborn and he locks himself away for two years and does nothing but like work on his creation. Um, which but is we odd. aren't told like how he makes the monster, really. No, no, we aren't. Well, I mean, we know that he goes to graveyards and like charnel houses and gathers. Yeah. Like, but the reanimation plans. process. No, she keeps that secret. In the novel, I think Victor's like, I, I shall not tell for fear that you would tried to replicate my, my right, right, right. <laughs> which is you know it's that great thing where if you're ever writing a story and uh the main character is like a great poet uh don't ever show any of their poetry unless <laughs> you are also a great also poet. a great or, poet yeah, or yeah. like a comedian right if someone's writing a story about a great comedian and then you have them do a stand-up set and it's terrible and it's just brutal yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like some hacks idea of like what a great stand-up set is that, that i mean you can do what a lot of like up-and-coming stand-ups do and hire a stand-up to write it <laughs> <laughs> you could um but yeah but you know what i'm saying that's kind of what she's doing she's like yeah I shall not tell you the particular, but it's like, well, because obviously because it's not real, right? right? But in films, like, what, how is this usually represented? Like, how it's does like the monster... an electrical yeah, he, shock, yeah. But it's interesting that that's not in the novel. No. Like, he, he, for all we know, it's some, like, poultice that he, like, rubs together and sprinkles right. on the limbs or whatever. We're not given any explanation. Uh, 
But like when he creates this monster, like setting aside what actually happens, like this presents a really like hard apocalyptic scenario, namely mm -hmm. like if we could conquer life and death, like that in and of itself would be an apocalypse, right? 100%. <laughs> one, one that a lot of people seem to be pushing for. Oh, yeah. Really hard, right? right? Yeah. The, the fantasy of the singularity. That's I'm right. just going to upload myself and I'm going to live forever. Yeah. In the and cloud. It's like, it's like, well, what's the what's the implication of... I'm like... going to live right beside my photos. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that's too good. <laughs> uh, oh, there's my iTunes music purchases. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's my uh, mortal soul. Like... <laughs> I mean, um, in this case, it would be like usually with these immortality situations, like you can still die a violent death. Right? Yeah. So like, but the monster even in could this, be murdered. Right, but I mean, theoretically. It could still be brought back, right? Yes, yes. You could just keep just, pumping just, it just, just sew the arm back on or whatever, right? right? right. Like, um, but yeah, like a plane crash or some scenario that could happen, sure. Well, but I mean, if, that's the thing about the that sort of apocalypse, right? Is that like you obviously just like if you're you you have to have the immortality thing has to be with scarcity. You couldn't ever like actually give it to everybody. I mean, it would make no sense from like a resource perspective so or at right. least until you had somehow also conquered the need for natural resources right right yeah whereas a lot of these guys like it seems that they don't ever think about the, that the plan well because the plan is you're going to need a lot of money to live at all soon yeah and when we really dwindle these numbers down right these guys plan to kind of be like the last man standing that's what it kind of feels like there's like a survivalist perspective to it that like by virtue of surviving with their amassed wealth the looming climate apocalypse that they think a lot of them do think is like coming oh. that when they emerge their 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 prize should be they also get to live forever after after defeating like yeah you know, the rest of humanity it's like it's very very interesting uh to think that any of that is how this is actually going to go down <laughs> Yeah, and I mean we're seeing that with Mark Zuckerberg like buying up Hawaiian islands and like building a bunch of them. Yeah, nuclear bunkers. silos. They get. Yeah. Oh yeah, the silos. Uh, and at a certain point, they are like Victor, right? The the motivator really is just fear of death, right? It it has whatever to be happens. Like, they don't seem to have. It's weird because they present themselves as visionaries, right? But they don't seem to have anything particularly imaginative about no. what they would do. It just seems to be like, just to be there. <laughs> it it reminds me it, of that scene in The Office, the British version, when they're they're doing the team building exercise. And they ask, you know, what's your one dream? And, and Ricky Gervais, so David Brent says, like, to live forever, right? Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. like, like <laughs> yeah, that's right. That it's like the the kind of petty egotistical like imagination. Yeah, I mean, is and the and the funny thing is about those guys is that for all their like, you know, I'm the one knowledge shaping, that I'm they're the they're much closer. The These the guys are like much closer to David Brent than they think. Oh, I, <laughs> you know? I, 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 that's that's exactly right. Um, so Victor has spent two years. He's like cut off everyone. He's not talking to his friends. He's not talking to his family. He's like, <laughs> oh, yeah. he's, he's just like yeah. in the attic. More important uh, he's in the attic know. of his like expansive dorm room, like yeah. literally like lining up like shin bones and like sewing on muscles and stuff. Uh, Everyone else and, is doing shots. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. <laughs> his social life is just not in Germany, right? Great beer. Yeah. Like, you know, oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's, also, like he's not talking to his parents and stuff. His his dad and like his 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 girlfriend who he's who's betrothed to, he, are, they're like writing to him, and he's just like ah, whatever. Back to the monster. <laughs> um, and he, I think like the the moment of the creation is really interesting. This is book one of Frankenstein, chapter four. I'll just read a little excerpt here. It was on a dreary night of November. 
that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe? Or how delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavored to form? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful? Great God, his yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness. But these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. So, like, Victor... By a real buyer's remorse, huh? <laughs> well, exactly, right? <laughs> Victor spent two years of nonstop work on this thing, right? And he's like, and, this thing looks like shit. Yeah, like the instant it comes to life. And like, presumably five minutes before, he was like, well, there it is, you know, da, da, da. And then he yeah. like, do, he does the final step. It comes to life and he's like, what the? <laughs> right? Like, just like, what have I done? This thing right. is hideous. This is a disaster. Is that, like, does that strike you as realistic? Like that he just be... I mean, I guess that, yeah, you do have to like, make the leap because obviously you have some idea of what it was going to look like as he gets to the final stages well i mean you he's, know I think. he's presumably had all the time in the world to like create this yeah. also like we should note the creature is eight feet tall like the creature is like taller than minute bull right it's like <laughs> it's just it's like the massive yeah he, he like, clears yao ming oh yeah just dwarfs mm -hmm. him and mm -hmm. he has given him like these really pale complexion this yeah. these black lips for some reason this long flowing black mane of hair and yellow eyes and i i think what's important is like the moment it comes to life he enters into the uncanny valley are you familiar with that phrase the uncanny no. valley it's like a term people use to describe um, robots like if a robot looks like a robot and it's very like metal arms and legs and it's putzing around, you're like, oh, it's a robot. But if mm -hmm. a robot puts, you put like a bunch of plastic skin on a robot and it walks out and it's like a mannequin kind of coming to life, it, people are repulsed by it. People are like, <laughs> sure. get that away from me, right? right. The, people talk about this with CGI also. Like when you see an early CGI effort, where it doesn't, it's supposed to be a person, but you can just tell it's like a, that it that kind of is just dis, it disgusts people. Mm -hmm. That's that being or creation has fallen into the uncanny valley, and the goal of like CGI is to get onto the other side where like you right. can replicate someone seamlessly. Similarly, create a robot that's like uh, the replicants in um, in Blade Runner, right? That like is indistinguishable mm -hmm. from a human being because up until a certain point. People see a robot and they're just like, oh, get the disgusting thing away from me. <laughs> it's kind of what Victor is having here, right? He's like, I thought it looked beautiful. It looked beautiful when it was dead. But now that it's moving around, I'm like, this is this is not what I wanted at all. Have you ever had this experience, though, where you've worked really hard on something for a really long time? You've been caught up in it completely. And then it's finally done. And you, like, step back to look at your work. And you're just like, it's the I'm worst just, thing I've ever yeah. done in my life. <laughs> It's a matter of routine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I think it's, I think this is where the metaphor to like the Sam Altman's of the world falls short, right? Because he like immediately is like repulsed and bails out. Whereas, <laughs> whereas, whereas, Silicon whereas Valley these guys, guys just like remain convinced that everything is just fucking. But don't, don't you think Mark Zuckerberg the first time he like tested out the metaverse, some part of him must have been like, 
this sucks. yeah maybe on that occasion that's a little different right i don't think but it's kind of sim it's kind of similar though because you're creating this simulacrum of reality and like... yeah but like i guess it, you know zuckerberg had had a whole series of successes that he was obviously very riding happy high. with oh yeah, yeah and yeah. and that is kind of funny though the idea of just like zuckerberg abandoning the metaverse to everybody which is, and... which is what which is what has happened yeah he's yeah. abandoned it um so a lot of people focus but not as not as quickly as this guy no <laughs> victor is immediate yeah, like, yeah, yeah. zuckerberg the... like zuckerberg took there's a couple media cycles of i it, mean like, he, ha he hemorrhaged billions of dollars before he like took 60 off. billion dollars apparently <laughs> like some insane amount of money was spent on that and uh yeah so like a lot of people take frankenstein's like lab as this sort of like site of um like the industrial revolution right like that this lab is like a metaphor for like human uh you know uh like it's pushing things forward uh there's an article from 2006 by this guy bill phillips called mary shelley's wet ungenial summer in which he like kind of points us more towards the environment he says frankenstein's workshop and the monstrous product which emerges from it symbolize both the horrors of unrestrained technology and the hellish conditions now associated with the process of 19th century industrial production itself popular belief however that early 19th century england was being transformed from primarily rural and agricultural to an urban and industrial society must be challenged well, it is true that in 1784, 13 years before Mary Godwin, Mary Shelley, was born, the world's most powerful steam engine was installed in London, and over 100 steam engines were at work in London's flour mills, breweries, and tanneries. By 1815, only a relatively small portion of the industrial workers were engaged in large factories, and most Englishmen lived in little towns and villages, he says, quoting E.P. Thompson, the uh, uh, socialist historian and theorist. Um, so it's like, there's this temptation to be like, oh yeah, 1815 industrial revolution is like well underway. When, when in fact, like yeah. 1815, it's like, yeah, there are like a couple of machines like putzing away sure. in the background, but like for the most part, people are still like living on the farm, like chopping down the cherry yeah, exactly. tree. You know, like um, she says that like Phillips suggests instead we should be looking at like this is like a metaphor for the like the meddling with the environment that's like really kind of getting underway. Um, so what happens with the monster? Like the monster is abandoned immediately. Victor like runs out. The monster is like, he goes back to his bedroom. Victor's like, oh, damn, like that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> So close and yet so far. All right, off to bed. And he just like leaves the monster like in the lap. And it's like, yeah. it's Thinking, like, what could, what could possibly go wrong? Well, the monster's like, mama, it's just like feeling around. And then Victor wakes up to find the monster literally like reaching for him, being like, daddy, mm -hmm. teach me. Victor's like, oh, get away from me, you wretch. He like, he hates it. He like bats it away. He runs out of his, his apartment and he goes and like sleeps out in like the courtyard of someone else's dorm. <laughs> by chance the next day his friend henry is coming to visit monster of course will ultimately murder henry if you're not and uh henry's like victor it's been so long great to see you chap you know and he goes back to his apartment with henry and he's like wait here for a second he looks in and he's, I love like, this part. It, he's like is it gone oh it's gone all right yeah come on in you know it's just like does like nothing to yeah so what is that he just doesn't it doesn't feel any responsibility to figure out where the monster is no no doesn't what what might happen to it i mean what should victor have done once he realized he hated the monster like logically I... speaking probably gone to authorities and been like all right i think there's an eight foot monster <laughs> all right yeah, yeah that's one thing he definitely should have done <laughs> second of all well first of all he tells no one about the monster right which is awesome yeah uh yeah. maybe like get your gun and be like well this didn't work yeah you know, i mean you, just yeah, like, you could just like you uh, i meant more like once he, once he's out there it's like oh yeah but, search but even just together. just like immediate in the immediate aftermath of being yeah. like this is a disaster i, I want to just like Take take it off the board. You yeah, know? it's also like the conversation with the other dude. It's like he's like, so what are you up to? It's like, oh no, no, I don't know, hanging out. You know, <laughs> it's like, what have you been working on all this time? Yeah, you know, oh, studies. You know, you know <laughs> get my uh, diploma. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, the monster runs away. We learn later that it grabs one of Victor's coats because it's cold. Very conveniently, like all of his like, you know, his address book and like it's just like right. <laughs> this is where he can find and murder my family. It's like in the pocket, <laughs> right? Including a notebook about like how he made the monster and what the monster is, right? Of course. Very convenient. There's a lot of things in this book that I love that are just so convenient, right? Like the monster later finds a little cabin where there's just like this convenient crack in the wall where he can just stay and not be noticed for months, observe everything he needs to and never interfere, you know. To get all the training he could possibly want. What are the Yeah, chances? it's it's one he goes he's going through the forest, he finds a bag full of books, and they're like the three most perfect books. It's like Plutarch, the story of you know, great lives of ancient men, right? Then there's uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, Paradise Lost yeah. and then Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther, like the most emo, like <laughs> over the top. It's like, wow, those are those three books. Really, a tailor early, made... the really early emo that book. It's tailor so made. Oh, really? Truly, the the invention of emo occurred in mm -hmm. Goethe. Um, eventually, the monster does, like, the monster is just like rejected nonstop by humanity, right? he he like lumbers into a village and is like trying to eat and like these people see him and they're like wtf like get the get i the do guards. love that i do that's the part that's so fun because it's like you have this weather event you know in while they're writing it and stuff it's uh -huh. so funny to think of like because the monster isn't like it's not like godzilla you know what i mean like, no no it's eight, it's eight feet you know it's very big at a time Right, like like you said, like you know, they're like we don't even know they didn't know about the volcano, right? They couldn't figure it out. It's like yeah. it's obviously it would be like what the fuck is going on, but like the way that he describes the monster, it's like you could see some people being like, I've never seen this before, but like but whatever. after that, you're like, I don't know, I don't know what happened to this guy's skin. I don't know how he grew so tall. But like, <laughs> you know, he's at the tavern hanging out. I'm not going to be like, are you a monster? I, right, know, but people's reaction rude. to it immediately are just like, get the guns, get the torches. Yeah, let's that's let's, right. throw, let's throw bricks at this thing, right? Yeah. Every yeah. everyone he meets, in the, except with one exception in the entire novel, immediately attacks him. Uh, right. which I feel is... like I would just be like, you know, never guess who came into the pub. Man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so he he runs away he finds this cabin he's he conveniently the felix one of the kids living in the cabin has a wife who he has to teach how to read and write because she's turkish yada yada again mm -hmm. incredibly convenient that there should yeah. just be like a, a literacy lesson going on in this random cabin so the monster learns to read and write eventually he reads the letters he has in his pocket learns about victor uh says well i should go you know after he says well i'm I, he falls the, the monster falls in love with the people in the cottage right he's a voyeur i tell my students like the monster has a parasocial relationship with these people mm -hmm. it is as though they are the equivalent of like twitch streamers or youtubers right. that's right but the monster is like oh well i know everything about them they know nothing yeah. about me Oh, they're but coming I, to my town for a live show. I'm going to come and hang out. I'll, I'll be best friends. Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, that is a very dangerous, but uh, tragically common. Uh, yes. Um, and right. And you see these true crime stories about when that goes wrong. And like, you know, this sort of John Lennon scenario plays itself out. Except, yeah, that's uh, right. That's the right. Twitch streamer level or something. <laughs> yeah. it's, it has happened. It's very dark. But yeah. Um, he gets rejected by the people. He approaches the blind father and the blind father's like, yes, yes. Oh, hello, traveler. Like, how are you? And, and the implication being that like, because he cannot see what a freak the monster is, he's like, but as soon as the other people come in, they just like, they're instantaneously are just like swinging baseball bats at right. him. Like trying to, <laughs> um, so he gives up on his dream, his desolation. He, on the way to Victor's, he, like, rescues a girl who's, like, drowning in a river. And the father of the girl sees him holding her. And he just pulls out his gun and just shoots him. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's awesome, right? I mean, I yeah. love the monster being rejected. Uh, he eventually meets up with Victor on the mountaintop. Um, he murders Victor's brother. He sees Victor's brother and he's like, oh, there's a child. Like, he probably isn't prejudiced against me. I can, like, kidnap the child and, like raise him up to be my like my my one friend and like when uh, he when he starts talking to victor though he's like he's such a like 
emo bitch. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'll I'll read a little bit of that. In, it's in a so second. intense, man. Yeah. Um. <laughs> well, I mean, he has just murdered Victor's brother because, like, the kid is just like William Frankenstein is just like, stay away from me, you ogre. You're yeah, like yeah. a horrible monster. My daddy, doc, is Doctor Frank is like Mayor Frankenstein. He's like an important guy in the city. And as soon as he hears the name Frankenstein, <laughs> he he's like, ah, and he just literally just strangles the child, <laughs> and then. Blames the murder on the Frankenstein family babysitter, right? He like right. he like plants evidence on her. It's like, why did you do that? <laughs> it's like it's just so evil. Um, he sees Victor, and Victor immediately as soon as he hears his brother is dead, he's just like, Oh, the monster did it. Right. Yeah. He's back. <laughs> <laughs> And when he's coming home, he like there's a flash of lightning and like off on the side, it's like the monster is there. He's like, oh great, that was right. It is the monster. Oh, isn't this just fucking perfect? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is the one thing I didn't want to have happen. So he goes up to the mountains to to get away from it all after the stress of like uh, his brother's uh, funeral and then the subsequent hanging of the family babysitter just tea. <laughs> um, and he he sees the monster. And the monster's like leaping through the mountains and is like, I always tell my students, it's like the monster is like a bigger shack with the athleticism <laughs> of like, with the spryness of like Alan Iverson, right? right. Like, I mean, he's just like, he's this like unfathomable mix of athletic attributes. It's like, Victor, when you create your next monster, maybe you don't make him like the most perfect athlete and like, <laughs> yeah. who's, who's a giant <laughs> killing machine, you know, just like, so much of this if you're going on. to like at least teach them a three pointer, the game has changed so much. Yeah, so. yeah. Like... <laughs> um, he's he meets the monster and he says in book two, Devil, this is Victor. Do you dare approach me? And do you fear the fierce vengeance of my arm wreaked on your miserable head? Be gone, vile insect, or rather stay that I might trample you to dust. And oh. That I could, with the extinction of your miserable existence, restore those victims whom you have so diabolically murdered. And then the monster says, I expected this reception. <laughs> all men hate the wretched. How then must I be hated who am miserable beyond all living things? Yet you, my creator, detest and spurn me, thy creature, to whom thou art bound by ties only dissoluble by the annihilation of one of us, you propose to kill me. How dare you sport thus with life? Do your duty towards me, and I'll do mine towards you. And the rest of mankind, if you comply with my conditions, I will leave you them and you at peace. But if you refuse, I will glut the maw of death until it be satiated with the blood of your remaining friends. <laughs> it's like, whoa, monster. <laughs> and then Victor says, abhorred monster, fiend that thou art. The tortures of hell are too mild a vengeance for thy crimes, wretched devil. You reproach me with your creation. Come on, then, what I may that I may extinguish the spark which I so negligently bestowed. My rage was without bounds. I sprang on him, impelled by all feelings which one arm can be, <laughs> which can arm one being against the existence of another. He easily eluded me and said, <laughs> Be calm. I love the monster. He's just like leaping at the monster. The monster's just like, dodge, no yeah, problem. I expected this reception. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be calm. I entreat you to hear me before you give vent to your hatred on my devoted head. Have I not suffered enough that you seek to increase my misery? Life, although it may only be an accumulation of anguish, is dear to me and I will defend it. Remember, thou hast made me more peace powerful than thyself. My height is superior to thine, my joints more supple. But I will not be tempted to set myself in opposition to thee. I am thy creature. I will be even mild and docile to my natural lord and king, if thou wilt also perform thy part, the which thou owes me. O Frankenstein, be not equitable to every other, and trample upon me alone, to whom thy justice, and even thy clemency and affection is most due. Remember that I am thy creature. I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather the fallen angel, whom thou drivest from joy for no misdeed, Everywhere I see bliss, from which I alone am irrevocably excluded. This is the insult I have, right? 
everyone around me is happy, but I'm lonely. <laughs> yeah, right. I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. Why doesn't anything good ever happen to me? Yeah, exactly. Even though you've like stumbled onto li this literature that's made you like this incredibly well-spoken <laughs> monster in a very short period of time. Some things have gone your way. He says, be gone. I will not hear you. There can be no community between you and me. We are enemies. Be gone or let us try our strength in a fight in which one must fall. So like if I were Victor and the monster came up to me and was like, I entreat you, my Lord. I am like, I should be like thy Adam, but rather, you know, just like giving all yeah, these yeah. Like, I would be like, wow, like, who, I did, did it. You? Like, where did you learn all of this? I, this yeah, is a, I would this take is a, some this is credit, amazing. Though, for this is having a, built. Yeah, this is amazing. Like, like, you are a marvel. And, like, this isn't that long after he created it, right? No. It's, like, just some months later. It's kind of unspecified. He's got it's, no questions as to how this happened. Doesn't care at all. The Does monster. The monster will tell him eventually. But, you know, it's <laughs> uh, very strange, right? So the, the big crux of the whole novel is that like the monster really wants a girlfriend right it's shocking like, it's like no matter what what world we're in it, it comes down to no no escaping it this, so this incel <laughs> being like well, i don't want to get a girlfriend <laughs> it's it's really funny um like i'll just like go to the the scene where Victor, like, makes up these elaborate excuses. He goes up to the north of Scotland, postpones his wedding, does makes all these contrivances, and he's going to, like, re he's going to remake the female creature. Yeah. And, like, this is the last apocalyptic, like, aspect of the novel I want to touch on before we wrap up. He mm -hmm. says, as I sat, he, he's in his little, like, lab in Scotland. Back and he, he suspects the monster is there. Like, the monster probably followed him. As I sat, a train of reflections occurred to me, which led me to consider the effects of what I was now doing. Three years before, so this is just three years that passed since, since he made the monster, right? Uh, three years before, I was engaged in the same manner and created a fiend whose unparalleled barbarity had desolated my heart <laughs> and filled it forever, the bitterest remorse. I was now about to form another being of whose disposition I was alike ignorant. She might become 10,000 times more malignant than her mate. And delight for its own sake and murder and wretched 10,000 times more malignant. Wow. I mean, that's, that's little, a little a bit of sexism in there. Yeah. Like, oh, this, I, the I, woman's going to be even crazier. <laughs> well, no. I, yeah, exactly. He had sworn to quit the neighborhood of man and hide himself in deserts, but she had not. And she, who in all probability was to become a thinking and reasoning animal, might refuse to comply with the compact made before her creation. They might even hate each other. Creature already lived, loathed his own deformity, and might he not conceive a greater abhorrence for it when it came before his eyes in the female form? So it's like he already hates himself. Yeah, so if I make it, not, I make she's it not girl, even hot. The... Yeah, yeah, I mean exactly. Victor, <laughs> Victor's so canceled. She also might turn with disgust from him, the superior beauty, superior beauty of man. Right? She might be into Victor, not into the, yeah. the monster. Then we got a real problem. Yeah, it's like a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> she might quit him and he'd be again alone, exasperated by the fresh provocation of being deserted by one of his own species. That I love. That I love that he like he like is like, wait a minute, what if she what if she's not into him? <laughs> then we gotta then then how many people is this motherfucker gonna kill? Exactly. <laughs> Where does it end? Like I I I like this because he's like really engaged with what he did after having no like Having not, not a desire to think through all, it while he was doing it. At all for three right. years. Right? Which which kind of like makes a bit of sense to me in the way of like, you know, when you get those guys, you'll, like you'll once a year, you'll get someone write an article that's like, um, I worked at Facebook and I don't even, you I, I now don't use a computer because of what I know it's doing to our brains, the attention economy and all this. Like these like yeah. converts who like, they get into the, to the hallowed walls of, twitter or google or whatever yeah. they get these jobs and then they realize it's like, it's evil <laughs> yeah oh my gosh this and is now they're problem. gonna they're the they're gonna expose the wizard of oz for all right and somehow see. people who like have nothing to do with any of these companies could just take one look for five seconds and be like that's not gonna be good <laughs> yeah 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 no, <laughs> but this guy it, thinks he's like really breaking it like you know you know it's actually meant to be addictive that's why we did, chose the scrolling method did you know that it's like yeah we fucking know we're all addicted <laughs> yeah <laughs> Wow, thanks. 
<laughs> Thanks for the shocking news. Um, <laughs> so the one thing the monsters promises to do is that if he makes a girlfriend for him, he'll go to South America and he'll leave Europe, which is hilarious because it's like, oh yeah, well, there's no people there, right? Like yeah, we'll, just, we'll just put the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's, what, it's like the monsters just become like colonizers yeah well essentially right yeah. like yeah I, there's a colonialist re post-colonialist reading of this that, that gets into that but um uh even if they were to leave europe inhabit the deserts of the new world yet one of the first results of those sympathies for which the demon thirster would be children and a race of devils would be propagated upon the earth who might make the very existence of the species of man a condition precarious and full of terror. So but it's like, even like he, he, the sense I get from, yeah. from listening to the monster is that it didn't have to go this way. And in fact, it seems like he has the capacity to not do that. And in fact, has been like, I won't do this stuff anymore. Like here's I'm here's like a reasonable agreement. Like you yeah. should, should do after a like, few things for right. me after you abandoned right. and me. Sure, and I, sure. I've been acting out, but in fairness, you also I did murder me. your brother. My yeah. bad. You know, but you and, know, and, Victor, and you've not been the greatest fucking creator. Okay. Yeah. You haven't yeah. been the greatest creator. Meanwhile, this guy's like, oh no, this this person, this monster that I made is immediately irredeemable forever. Even though all those other options might actually like stave off the apocalypse, the the the, the danger. Well, also, the, like he's worried about he's, he's worried about them having kids. Like, what's an easy way to fix that? Right? Aren't you in control of this process? Aren't you making the female monster? Are you like? Is there some right. requirement right. that she be able right. to like reproduce? Like, can, right? Like, don't put those parts into her body. Like, just come don't on. put the parts in. Just don't yeah. put the parts in. He's in control, but he's like, no, they might have kids. And then he imagines this fantasy of like a race of monsters literally like surging yeah. over humanity. That no because, doubt come back to find him. <laughs> well, of course, but also just kill everyone because they're yeah. more athletic. This is a kind of like uh, evolutionary anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. Evolution wouldn't be theorized formally for another 40, 50 years after this, but these ideas were already in circulation. I mean, Charles Darwin's granddad, Erasmus Darwin, was already like on the case mm -hmm. and like talking about evolution in the 1790s. Uh, Erasmus Darwin overlooked. Also, Erasmus Darwin was one of the scientists who wrote his scientific papers as poems. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we have no flair anymore. They had, yeah, they had I mean that's flair. That's I mean that's flare. that's like a real throwback. Like that's going back to the ancient Greeks. Like yeah. the, the Greek philosophers would write their like treatises as poems, or or, or Plato. Plato wrote plays, mm -hmm. right? I mean, okay. di Socratic dialogue. <laughs> Any case, Erasmus Darwin is, is very funny. A decent poet too. Not, not he's no he's no Percy Shelley. Let's put it that way. Um, had I a right for my own benefit to inflict this curse upon everlasting generations, I had been moved by the sophisms of the being I had created. I had been struck senseless by his fiendish threats, but now for the first time, the wickedness of my promise burst upon me. I shudder to think that future ages might curse me as their past, whose selfishness had not hesitated to buy its own peace at the price, perhaps, of the existence of the whole human race. So he's like, ah, uh, again, but Victor is so egotistical. He's like, oh, future generations might blame me for destroying them. So yeah, I don't want my bad name to be like caught up. Like he he can't get out of this. Like, uh, I I mean, I have a I have a bit of respect for that. If, you know, playing through the metaphor that like these these types today they got they have no shame like that. They don't even they don't check themselves in that way at all. No, and they yeah. all want their names to be on everything, right? Well, like, it, it's like this idea that, like, well, you know, there's going to be a bit of turbulence in the next hundred years, but we're going to, you know, that <laughs> well, turbulence just happens to be like the death of billions of people. But, you know, like, just the way it's supposed to go right now, you know, things are going to work out. <laughs> Whereas at least this guy's like, well, you know, yeah. I don't think I can actually go through with this. <laughs> um, Just finishing up the passage. Victor, uh, he's working on the female monster's body. It's like right there. It's like, I trembled and my heart fell within me. When on looking up, I saw by the light of the moon, the demon at the casement. So the monster's just like at the window looking in the whole time. <laughs> A ghastly grin wrinkled his lips as he gazed on me, where I sat fulfilling the task which he had allotted to me. Yes, he had followed me in my travels. He had loitered in forests, hid himself 
in caves or taken refuge in wide and desert heaths. And he now came to mark my progress and claim the fulfillment of my promise. But he, didn't, I, he doesn't like weigh in. He doesn't weigh in, right? Which no, is the monster's just like, like the monster's just like smiling in. He's like, and the monster like it? looks like shit. Yeah, and he's now asked him to make a a, a female because it's so important to him. Well, I mean, the but monster... he doesn't. It, he doesn't care what the female looks like. It seems no, he's got no, no input. No, he's happy. He's really he's thrilled. Fine. Yeah, just he's puts like, them oh, together. Victor's making them the girl monster. It's yeah, all yeah. his, his <laughs> dreams about the girls. So I looked on him. His countenance expressed the utmost extent of malice and treachery. <laughs> that was a sensation of madness. My promise of creating another like to him and trembling with passion tore to pieces the thing on which I was engaged. So he sees. Well, I guess the, and the monster's watching him like tear it up. Oh yeah, and the monster yeah. immediately <laughs> I mean, is that's... like, monster's like, why God, why? Like, yeah, monsters yeah. <laughs> just start screaming. You know, this is like his worst. But it's like the incel is like about to get married, and the right. the wife leaves yeah. him at the altar. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, like the right. it's like the worst realization of uh, the monster's fantasy. Uh, or the dad's so... like, you can't marry this sack of shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's or like, like, does any does anyone object? And it's like yeah, every and, and everyone objects. Everyone objects. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. I know. One day. Um, so the monster's like, I'll be with you at your wedding night. Like, you've betrayed me. I'm not gonna Mur- immediately goes and just murders Victor's best friend. Henry uh yeah. eventually he frames Victor for it. Victor gets off though, because he's rich. And then uh he go Victor gets married, Elizabeth, his wonderful bride, who's also his cousin. Never mind. Uh, they go off on their honeymoon, and Victor like takes the monster's threat, like "I'll be with you on your wedding night." To mean he's going to kill him on his wedding night, because again, yeah. Victor's like an egomaniac. He can only, and it's like, no, Victor. Like, he, what has the monster done to hurt you so far? It's like killed right. your friend, killed right. your brother. He just wants you to suffer. How have you not right. figured this out yet? Uh, he's very dumb. So he kills Elizabeth, of course. Victor's like got guns and stuff. He's like on patrol, and hears a scream from the bedroom, and like. Elizabeth's dead, right? Yeah. Uh, in the movie version uh, that the Kenneth Branagh did, uh, where Robert De Niro plays the monster, curious mm-hmm. choice. The monster is eight feet tall. Robert De Niro is a five foot five, right? I mean, it's right. <laughs> trick photography. He's pretty good. He's he's pretty compelling in it, though. Yeah, it's not a it's not a it's not a particularly good movie, but no, no. But he's it's fun. I like his it. look. Is his look is good? He's like, Argh! yeah, there's some good screams. Um, in the in the in the Brana movie, uh, Victor brings his wife back to life, but then she has more in common with the monster, and they end up all dying together. It's a it's a real disaster. Uh, yeah, I don't know. What do you think of Frankenstein? Any final? I mean, ways? let's talk a little bit just about this this last idea of like, you know, the the fear of artificial the mo- intelligence. Yeah, because right. that's that's sort of where I see this. I mean, this is considered by many to be the first sci-fi movie. Right? Yeah. The, the, I mean, that's the way I mean, that's the way it came across when reading it now. Yeah. It definitely feels like the elements that we see so often in modern day current sci-fi are definitely there's yeah, a I mean, ton the ton that's coming the ter- out of this. the Terminator. Um the Terminator is this. What's the Deus Ex Machina or Ex Machina, oh, it's just called? Yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where the guy like makes makes the woman. I mean, there's a or thousand. There's a, th- a thousand. Her, of <laughs> right. I mean, some of these people right. we'll talk about in the future. That's right. Um, and and this is kind of like a foundational text for all of this. Oh, right? the Hulk, right? The guy gets irradiated, becomes yeah. this monster. Right. right. Uh, the Hulk is this combined with Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, right? Like the other. Right? Anyway, right. Um, it's just it's just it, it's interesting that like you know instead of having Victor like get too deep right it's like the interesting choice that's made as opposed to most of what you see it's like instead of the creator getting too deep into a mess and it's inescapable and he immediately removes himself from yeah, engagement yeah, he, with the thing he, he abandons it i think yeah that, yeah to me that's the most striking part of it right is the his creativity his creation of the monster is mostly marked by neglect right yeah. he just he neglects the creature Right. And then when in he fact, does, in a way, the least the least important part is the creation because yeah. he doesn't follow. There's no point in him having created it because he doesn't involve himself with it. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, now, what this fantasy of them reproducing and them coming back to take over like humanity? I mean, this is where the, like you said, like the 
the sort of rep the rep self replicating mm -hmm. creation uh that that comes back to haunt you right i mean like a cylon in battlestar yeah exactly i mean it literally every like every sci-fi trope is like this right i mean this mm -hmm. is this is like where all of this stuff comes from it's anxiety the idea of the mad scientist right yeah i always ask my students i'm like do you guys know any mad scientists irl have you ever met a, a mad scientist <laughs> <laughs> they, no one ever has kind of yeah. disappointing right you imagine meeting a scientist and you're like oh my god this, this one's mad yeah like <laughs> <laughs> you, you like go to his lab there's like a spider robot that's like stinging but, things like what do you think she what do you think shelly is 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 trying to say i mean she's not obviously speaking about fears of ai because it's up but like no when it comes to technology technological advancement and well i think, uh, I think you know the environment and all that stuff like what do you think her i think i think it's a warning about ambition right to keep yeah. your ambition under check and that yeah. you know when you create something whether it be a uh work of art or a political movement or that you, that you got to have uh, responsibility for it, right? That you can't just you can't just right. abandon it and let it run pell mell, or right. there will be negative consequences. That and I think that's like you. that's sort of what I think ends up coming around to the to the to the modern day that we're talking about, which is like the two the two elements. There there's really no responsibility, it seems, um, in any of these facets. You know, when it comes to the preservation conservation of the environment. Um, the preservation conservation of our minds as they interact with this stuff um yeah. preservation interaction you know the preservation of conservation of culture there's no responsibility it's just like right it's like let's just, just have the ai scrape all of shakespeare and this and like the, other, this this, this hands up it's it's inevitable too. it's out of my yeah. hands yeah I it's out of my hands That's, i can't stop I mean, it it's sort of like a victor like thing in a way of just being like well you know i mean what are you going to do it's here now and and yeah. then the second piece of it I find just as interesting, which I think, you know, I, I think really dictates the way I think about why nothing happens. That like the sad thing about what we have is it just feels like our ambitions are pretty boring. I yeah, the people who are in charge and leading this stuff, like they think because they it's like they've become their own sci-fi characters. Yeah. And they seem to think that like this immortality is somehow um uh has within it some sort of inherent value yeah it's good enough be itself. alive forever yeah but it's bare let's be honest like there's not even enough inherent value to be alive for 80 years like you gotta <laughs> make something mean something that's right and, and like we don't really do a great job well, these of are making people something who, mean something right now as a society i don't think these these are people who would find mary shelley's book that she wrote when she was a teenager to be boring or or not yes. interesting you know and yeah. the, the only works of literature they like are like ayn rand which are oh, all just like among the greats for sure uh, I mean, have you ever read ayn rand michael i read the the atlas, atlas you, read, you read atlas shrug nice. yeah did you read the fountainhead but, though no oh the fountainhead's great i mean I it's mean, I just it's tested i just it's tested I mean, the, oh it's her it's laughable is, it's i didn't find it boring I, thought, I, was, I thought it was very i thought it was very Funny, I mean, because like it's I, a pulp I, novel. She's a pulp. Yeah, like novel. I knew enough to it's hate so it funny. In, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> you know? Of course. Where this, like, to to read Fr Shelley's Frankenstein, think of it as boring, is insane. Like, well, it's it much more sophisticated. It's a fucking nuanced. banger of a yeah, book. It great. really is. It's great. Um, it's like it's funny. Like we've done the stuff we've done so far. Yeah, and like even the stuff that I like, like you know, pretty like Last of Us is a cool show. It's like yeah, yeah. It's a, a funny reminder of like the, the there's levels to this shit, and you're like yeah. to go from the postman in Waterworld to this book was yeah. a pretty funny experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. Uh, good. Kevin well, Costner's not quite thinking of things yeah, at the same yeah, level good. as Mary Shelley. Who Costner knew? maybe not as rigorous a reader of Rousseau as uh, <laughs> yeah. As, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, All right, this is great. So, what are we talking about next week? Do you remember? I think it's strange love. That's right. Uh, That's right. So well, it won't be, I, you know, one of the great directors, Stanley Kubrick, uh, mm. a really smart film, a really fun. I mean, one, of, one of my all time favorite movies. Yeah. Obviously. I mean, one of the best movies of all time. And so we'll be moving from, you know, possible uh, 
world annihilation at the hands of self-replicating Frankenstein monsters to uh, <laughs> the very real possibility of nuclear annihilation. Uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So yeah. uh, remember to subscribe, tell your friends about the pod, follow us on Instagram at the end of the world uh, WMS. And anything else you want to plug, Michael? No, but I was just going to say, um, you know, this is the end of the world with Michael and Stu. And I'm, I'm Michael. And I'm Stu. And uh, <laughs> we'll get that Let's right. Let's do it again. Let's days. do it again next week. All right. Look forward to it. Yeah, man.